Hall. <laughs> Paging executive director Hall. All right. Um, item number nine, we have, I believe, 24 public comments. So uh, let's begin in the order received, the order that I received the public comments. Uh, Mr. Nichols from DLA. Order of received reversal because that was last. Um, <laughs> Everyone pretty much hates you right now. I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or me, but that's yep. like an inevitability. So thank you for having me up here and your time. Um, I'm Matt Nichols with DLA Piper. Um, used to be the liner, so I think that's last report that you guys have seen. So I am an attorney there, I do lobbying myself. I'm also joined by Tracy, who does a lot of our reporting. Um, so we have a lot of experience in the current requirements and the burden that already exists for uh, properly reporting. And we're here because we want to ensure that we remain in compliance as do the rest of the people here. And so this, these additional requirements really add to our um, burden we already have and without targeting any unregistered lobbyists, which as expressed at the last hearing really should be the focus. Um, and this just raises the bar of the economy. It's going to decrease the incentive. So uh, the last hearing, there were a lot of comments that I won't read here. Um, but after seeing the updated draft, which didn't change any of the, the points of contention, we feel the uh, public comments, which were overwhelmingly um, in opposition to the ordinance, and then, then were not fully considered. Um, in particular, um, the the um, ten day requirement feels overly burdensome. Private attorney general provision um, would is horrifying, and this the, the amendment combined taken as a whole is going to decrease public disclosure. It, it really does. So for that reason, we hope that this is not a Thank you. Thank you. So I, I wanted to wait for you, but I just went to over so we have to continue. Um, Mr. Gutierrez from Lincoln Walk. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. I'm Peter Gutierrez with Lakeman Watkins, a member of the regulated community, and here to just let you know that you know we take our reporting requirements very seriously, as, as I'm sure the regulated community does. But we do have some concerns that we want to share this morning, and some of my colleagues are going to speak to a little bit more of the detail, including uh, one of my uh, colleagues who actually does the actual reporting. But you know, the 10-day time frame for uh, uh, submitting uh, the reports is um, is a concern to us. Uh, accuracy, of course, is is important. We want to make sure that we have accurate reporting. People go on vacation, and people travel, uh, and and it's a it's a lot of uh, a lot of work to put together all of the reports and the the details with dates and and, and uh, names of officials and and all is also another sort of. Uh, requirement that, that gives us some concern. We're often getting calls in the car um, and traveling, and so um, you know I think that's something that we want to, to bring to the attention again as I concern those details. And you'll hear more detail on some of this from from my colleagues. But I just wanted to sort of set the table for that. And thank you for your time this morning, and thank staff for their hard work. Uh, and um, with that, we got a lot of people here from. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I didn't bring out work. Was there a request from everyone to Lake and Watkins to go in a certain order? Okay. Mr. Hines? I did, I'll see. Of the points I was going to make have been made, so thank you. Okay. Mr. Stromberg. Mm 
Good morning, Commissioner. My name is Winston Stromberg. I'm a land use attorney at Latham and Watkins and a registered lobbyist here in the city. Latham's land use practice covers jurisdictions throughout California, including many here in LA County, many of which have lobbying ordinances and reporting requirements. We take our ethical obligations very seriously and have internal policies and practices in place to ensure that reporting requirements in all jurisdictions are met, including here in the city. While we are certainly not opposed to revising the city's lobbying ordinance to ensure transparency and clarity in the law, many provisions in staff's proposal are troubling and expand the current ordinance in unnecessary ways. The focus of my comments is on staff's proposal that lobbyist reports disclose each direct contact with city employees, namely the date of the contact and the title of the employee. This is unnecessary and overly burdensome. The current reporting requirement gives adequate information to the public, especially when compared to the burden of trying to keep track of every telephone call, email, or text message to city employees, whether sent or received from the employee and whether made at city offices, the lobbyist offices, in the car, etc. Lobbyists, especially on complex land use projects, meet and or communicate regularly regarding many, uh, with city employees regarding many issues related to a project. Even if a meeting is requested with a, a, to a particular employee, sometimes that employee may bring others to the meeting. The proposed revision to the ordinance would put an affirmative obligation on the lobbyist to track down the title for every single individual attending such a meeting, even if the lobbyist had no idea the individual would be there in the first place or the individual leaves before the meeting ends. The same could be said for emails, where many city employees might be CC'd. Would all of their titles need to be researched by the, and disclosed? The city also does not have an accurate or updated database or organizational chart showing every employee's name and title. Every department handles this differently, and if the city is going to require lobbyists to disclose the title, there should be a corresponding obligation put on the city to maintain accurate and readily available databases listing every employee and title. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Burkhoff. Good morning. Arnie Burkhoff, uh, Arnie Burkhoff and Associates. I'm also representing the LA Lobbyist Association. I, I'm going to be do what I tell my clients and not repeat what everybody's saying, but clearly I think we, we believe that the reporting requirements of uh, doing it more frequently are um, could be okay, but not at the same time when they're asking for the, for the reports to be doubled or tripled in terms of what we would have to report. It's just not feasible, uh, it's not practical, and I'm not even sure what the point of it is. Uh, in terms of reporting um, every contact we make, right now, uh, lobbyists, including my firm, we report uh, who our client is, how much they pay us, what agencies we lobby, um, and what the subject matter is. Uh, I think from any public policy perspective, that's more than adequate. Uh, the point of, of um, again, as I said last time, of uh, reporting the 13 people that I've already talked to in City Hall this morning, I just walked down to City Council during the bathroom break, and I've probably talked to six people. It, it's, and I'm not gonna be able to keep records of everyone I talked to the time I talked to them what the subject was. Um, I believe all it really is is, is a, um, serves as kind of a, a, a trap for violations. Um, I'm proud to say that in the 20 years that I've had my firm, we've never even had a notice of inquiry, let alone, let alone a violation. And I could just see that within the first year, I'd have 50. And I'm not sure what the public policy benefit is. And frankly, I, don't, I really don't see any. Um, my personal mentor was former um, city councilman supervisor Ed Edelman. And he, uh, I never made a personal decision or professional without his advice. Uh, and I miss him dearly, but he, he, every, he taught me something, that every law regulation should be trying to solve a problem. And I think here we have a solution in search of a problem. I don't know what that problem is. Thank you very much. <coughs> Mr. Sutton. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Jim Sutton, representing the Los Angeles Lobbyist Association. And we submitted a letter um, which, which outlines um, our general comments. And our point is that we really think that the goal is achievable. The goal of more timely, quicker reporting, important information to the public, 
that those can be met without putting these unnecessary burdens on the lobbying entities. Um, but there has to be trade-offs. And staff, for some reason, has not been willing to talk about these trade-offs. That the law has to focus on what's most important. What is the information that will give the public and city officials and the press the information they need? Not necessarily other questions which might be interesting, but which are simply too much work to compile and potentially too accurate, too inaccurate. Um, and frankly, lobbying entities are simply less likely to complain about the reporting requirements and more likely to comply, to really register if the reporting forms are short and to the point. And that is what we propose, and we, we submitted that outline in the letter, that you have two month reporting and a 20 day deadline. That's a compromise. But that you focus the reporting on the fees earned from clients, not how much lobbying firms pay their lobbyists. You disclose the city matters and the city agencies lobby, but not the titles of the city employees. And you name the candidates or the officials which the lobbyist has fundraised for, but not every single check that might have been given at that event. And that's really a compromise. It was very surprising to us that staff did not listen to any of the public comments at the two interested persons meeting. We gave you a summary of those comments, which were almost universally critical. Because staff has really not accepted any of those comments, we really believe that today you should reject the staff proposal and instead look at this streamlined proposal, streamlined reporting alternative. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Um, Ms. Kitamura. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Deanna Kitamura with Asian Americans Advancing Justice Los Angeles. We work on issues affecting the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. We provide both direct services and do larger advocacy um, regarding policies and litigation. Uh, in terms of, of direct services, we focus on the low income community. And uh, for example, um, our, our direct services includes providing family law and immigration services to domestic violence survivors and providing naturalization services to those who want to become citizens. And this past month, our DACA team was completely swamped filing um, DACA renewals for DACA recipients. In terms of city advocacy, this year our, our um, immigrant rights staff advocated for low, um, local funding of the LA Justice Fund to pay for immigrant um, detention defense and the city of LA agreed to that. We strongly support a blanket exemption for 501c3 organizations. When we meet with city council members and staffers and appear at hearings, we're doing so not on behalf of a, a client who's paying us, we do that because we see a pattern of a problem that affects our clients generally or, or the broader community. Um, and because we work in coalition, we often ask small groups to join us in our advocacy. Now, we haven't done a full analysis of the proposal that you have come up with, um, but, but we will we'll need to do so. And when we do that, we'll have to take into consideration whether we ask small groups to join us in our coalition to come out to hearings with us. And we probably will ask, we probably would not ask them because it's a heavy burden. We're making, we're asking them to, for a favor and they're having to take on this heavy burden. And without their voice, the city loses the, the grassroots voice, they lose the community voice. And so um, that's why we're asking for the exemption. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Samuels from Leoba. Thank you, uh, Commissioners. I'm here, my name is Robin Samuels, and I'm here as a member of Leo Beck. I'm a volunteer uh, from Leo Beck Temple, and we are very proud to partner in our social justice advocacy work with LA Voice and all the 53 interfaith congregations. Um, the, as a nonprofit whose whole job is to transform LA County into a 
um, more just and livable community, being able to lobby our legislators is a really important part of what LA Boys does. The fact that I'm here today is testament to the fact that uh, one of their jobs is to train community people how to advocate on our behalf of ourselves and our communities to our legislators. Uh, we would not, we uh, fear that these new ordinance, that this new ordinance would make that very difficult for people like me. Um, also, it would um, make it easier for um, there to be litigation, possible litigation against our organization by people who oppose our views. And um, we also strongly ask you to exempt 501c3 organizations from this regulation, if at all possible, and if not, to at least exempt those of us who are working, like the city council is, to magnify the voices of the most marginalized in our community and to create a better community for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Newman from Public Council. Good morning, uh, commissioners. My name is Ewan Nune, and I'm a staff attorney at Public Council. Public Council provides free legal services to, public, to people struggling with poverty and to nonprofits that work to improve the lives of low income communities in LA County. We assist hundreds of nonprofits with various legal issues, including lobbying and advocacy, to ensure their sustainability. We find that the C3 exemption in the proposed uh, municipal lobbying ordinance is too narrow, and many nonprofits not meeting this narrow definition but are working on behalf of disadvantaged, uh, underserved communities in Los Angeles will be forced to register and report their lobbying activities. Because the registration and reporting requirements are overly burdensome, many organizations, especially small nonprofits, will simply stop lobbying at the city level, and the city will lose the perspective of the most vulnerable Angelenos. This will ultimately undermine the purpose of the ordinance, which is to level the playing field. As previously mentioned in, other, in, our, in our previous hearings, nonprofits are not similarly situated to businesses as they are limited by their charitable purpose and are required to report their lobbying activities in their federal filings. Most concerning is the proposed private right of action, which will have a chilling effect on all nonprofits, especially those that serve marginalized communities. We encourage the commission to broaden the nonprofit exemption to all C3s, or at the very least, <coughs> C3s that engage disadvantaged people in city decision making. This will ensure that city residents who typically do not have access have a voice in the decision making that impact their lives. Thank you. Mr. Mitchell from Lake Milwaukee, I'm sorry. President Levinson and members of the uh, Ethics Commission, my name is Patrick Michelle uh, with Layton and Watkins. I'm a, a lobbying compliance staff. Um, I've been doing uh, lobbying registration and reports for 15 years. Uh, it's been suggested that the commission members might be interested in hearing from the folks in the trenches who actually prepare these reports. Um, I also have experience uh, as a registered lobbyist and uh, I have experience in uh, preparing legislative processes uh, on the city side. I was with the city for 17 years and eight years with uh, Councilman Mike Wu as his legislative deputy. Um, one thing I want to mention as I, I go into my comments here is that Latham is a big firm and that we have 19 lobbyists, 40 clients registered with the city and then we have a huge number of other jurisdictions similarly uh, registered. Uh, we've done a good job, I think, in folding in the reporting and lobbying into our um, uh, uh, payroll system, and so that's the, the mechanism that we use. We're different than perhaps a one or two firm person. Um, I'd like to talk about, the, the, from my perspective, the 10-day reporting period, and I just paraphrase by saying, what a nightmare. Uh, the horror story that we sort of envision in, in the people filling out the reports is coming in in July when there's a report uh, due that month in 10 days, and everybody's on vacation because it's the 4th of July. Uh, it's a 4th of July two day week or four day weekend. Um, the, uh, the staff that are supposed to be there to sign things uh, aren't. They're on vacation because they're taking a full week. So we start off with five days you know, behind out the door. Um, 
And then it takes a lot of time to get the, uh, the data collected, get it okayed, and then electronically file it. Uh, and, and I have to say, these, these examples always assume perfectly performing uh, actors and that our attorneys are always happy to hear us call up and say, you know, you have to fill in your, your, your reports. We need these right now. So that doesn't really happen. Um, also, we have a few clients uh, who are lobbyist employers and they have to file reports as well and we have to uh, coordinate with them. So it, it does take an additional amount of time. That's two minutes. <laughs> Okay, one, 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 one I want to close with then. Um, I would like to say that the, uh, the current online registering system and reporting is one of the best that I've ever seen, and I filed with, uh, with ten, more than 10 jurisdictions. And what I like is that the city's uh, software is robust and it doesn't crash. Um, I've also told, told Mark Lowe, your staff, uh, that having someone on board who can fix the software glitches quickly is a godsend. It really is uh, an excellent system. Uh, we've suggested changes and tweaks to the current system which would build us, which would build on its strengths and I think make it simpler and easier to use. And so I think you have an excellent program to, to build on rather than completely uh, re re reform. Thank you. Thank you and apologies for butchering your name. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Mr. Parks? My name is Richard Parks. I am a longtime resident of South Los Angeles. I serve on the board of a small nonprofit there. Um, we provide services in our community, such as after school tutoring, robotics programs, plant trees, paint murals, organized block clubs, shut down nuisance liquor stores, secure funding for active transportation in our community. And more recently, we've addressed the threat of neighborhood drilling in our community. So our homes have been sprayed with oil, cars in the streets sprayed with oil, uh, toxic fumes killing trees, driving people from the community. And for this reason, we've had to register our staff as lobbyists with the city. We're a very small nonprofit. It's very expensive. It's created an undue burden. We're already, because we're a 501c3, we're already accountable to the IRS for lobbying. Um, this, these proposed regulations increase that burden upon us. And I just, I have a feeling that that's, we're not who you had in mind uh, when you were doing this. Um, I also, you know, we're up against an industry that has very deep pockets that has deposed children in lawsuits. Um, we're very concerned that money and money interest, in our case, the oil industry, will weaponize these regulations to come after small nonprofits like us um, to really stifle our input into the policy policy making process. Um, again, I, I have a feeling that we're not who you have in mind, but it feels a little bit like um, straining out the gnats, but swallowing the camel. And I really encourage you to um, to provide a comprehensive exemption for small nonprofits um, like ours, and certainly to eliminate uh, the uh, the uh, right of action, the private right of action uh, component. Thank you. Speaker of the Inner City Law Center. I'd like to address the staff's stated approach to nonprofits under the uh, municipal lobbying ordinance, specifically treating similar situated uh, organizations the same. In theory, everyone supports treating similarly situated the same, but that presumes nonprofits are similarly situated to for profits. And with regard to already existing lobbying regulations, that's not the case. We're staff proposing that everyone have to be restricted like nonprofits already are, the nonprofits would be similarly situated. So we're staff to propose for for profits not to be able to contribute to or campaign for elected positions, prohibit lobbying in their own financial interests, limit lobbying to any insubstantial amounts of the budget, require lobbying to be disclosed on the tax forms to the IRS and disclosed to the state, and the loss of their for profit status for violation. They were talking about the same situation, but that's not the situation. I mean, if you're uncertain whether we're in the same situation as 
As for profits, you're invited to come to our office in Skid Row and compare it to some of the offices of other people represented here. This is not about convenience for nonprofits. Uh, for nonprofits, this is about whether they're going to participate in this at all. Um, Staff's not proposing that nonprofits be similarly situated. Instead, staff is keeping additional and differing criteria for that already imposed exclusively on nonprofits. Nonprofits will need to dedicate even more of their limited budgets to administration to comply, and those with the least resources will be least able to ensure compliance. With the private right of actions, many nonprofits will be risking their existence, and, this, and in this highly partisan and adversarial political environment, disenfranchised people will be targeted. The result, small nonprofits will not participate. And so, like many systems, this will be yet another system that benefits the rich. Thank you. Ms. Dubok? Good morning, my name is Jessica Dubok. I'm here on behalf of the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber and other organizations here this morning are present and substantively weighing in because we want to work with the Department and Commission to be transparent and follow the law. However, it's disappointing that none of the concerns or suggestions from the regulated community at a hearing in front of this Commission a few months ago were taken into account. It is still not clear what problem this lobbying ordinance update is trying to solve for. <coughs> because getting the public information on policy activity sooner, we can adapt to more frequent reporting. However, creating a system by which we are increasing reporting shortening the amount of time to prepare the reports, and vastly upping the amount of information that report is supposed to contain, all while instituting a private right of action that opens us up to litigation based on the increased opportunity for minor mistakes is simply setting us up to fail. The Chamber also represents nearly 100 nonprofits who look to us for guidance on little changes like this. They are already reporting a chilling effect on their activities. These are organizations that are often looked to as resources by city officials for stories on what is going on on the ground and the impact of policy decisions. Greatly lowering the bar by which they are subject to having to file as lobbyists not only stops the flow of information, but also places their funding in jeopardy. A one-size-fits-all approach is not the best thing here. On behalf of the Chamber, I urge you to consider the impact these stringent changes will have on everyone's right to weigh in on the government decision-making process. We are happy to continue to weigh in on reasonable changes that balance disclosure and transparency with the work that we do. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kelly from PATH. Good morning. My name is Bridget Kelly, and I'm with PATH, People Assisting the Homeless. PATH is a statewide housing and homeless services organization dedicated to ending homelessness for individuals, families, and communities. With our roots in Los Angeles, our programs are committed to serving the most vulnerable individuals living on our streets. We have helped more than 7,300 individuals make it home into permanent housing since 2013, and we've been serving the LA community for more than 30 years. Mission-driven staff are not the same as paid lobbyists, and therefore we should not be treated the same under the law. The perspective provided by mission-driven nonprofit service providers is an integral component to impactful policymaking. The proposed changes, including new administrative burdens and the threat of litigation, would further deter nonprofits from participating in advocacy and threaten the city's ability to hold diverse discussions when crafting and determining the laws governing our city. In addition, the proposed changes will restrict our ability to participate in advocacy that could benefit the communities we directly serve. Now, more than ever, especially now, nonprofits need to have an accessible place in the public process to advocate for vulnerable communities and populations at the local level. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Soto from Children's Defense Fund. Okay, we'll take, we'll take a while. We'll come back. Uh, Mr. Duvall from California Community Foundation. <coughs> Foundation. Um, our mission is to advance nonprofit system change to uh, strengthen Los Angeles communities. And so we also we fund dozens of organizations, nonprofits who work on issues ranging from equitable land use, planning, uh, ending homelessness, to immigrant rights, access to health care, transit, and city services. Broadening the definition of lobbyists, requiring registration, and increasing enforcement will place a significant burden on a number of these organizations. Um, 
organizations that are providing, uh, primarily providing services but are compelled to advocate on occasion, uh, meaning that these are not um, permanent features of their organizations, but that they're responsive and, and kind of time-limited actions would really burden these types of organizations from having to register as lobbyists and the like. Um, these organizations have a legitimate reason to participate in the decision-making process um, and are not paid by a client, but represent public interest uh, in key and vulnerable communities throughout the city. Uh, and so this measure, we believe, as a whole, will decrease civic engagement. And since these aren't, you know, since these groups aren't the same as paid lobbyists, they shouldn't be treated the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Srukmanian. How close was it this time? Uh, <laughs> Pretty close is not what we're shooting for here. Pretty close for the lobbying audience. I think the <laughs> Uh, good morning, commissioners and staff, and thank you for um, hosting interested persons meeting, especially focusing on input from the nonprofit community. Uh, I don't want to repeat too much of what's been said, but I just want to point out that universally people have commented on how these proposals would impose new burdens, and nonprofits, 501c3s, have specifically commented on how it would disproportionately affect them. It would lead to a chilling effect. They're already constrained in other ways. They face the threat of litigation, even if the lawsuit is never brought, just the threat of it can prevent people from participating or preventing groups from engaging community residents. And so for these reasons, I just wanna emphasize, we strongly urge an across the board 501c3 exemption or broadening, at least broadening the exemption from the current proposal to include organizations that engage underrepresented people in city decision making or in, in addition to the proposal or allowing nonprofits that are below a certain size to be exempt um, so they don't have to comply with these um, burdensome requirements. And again, if the goal is disclosure, because of the chilling effect, it's not clear that these proposals would even lead to that result. I also want to point out that the threshold for indirect lobbyists has been lowered from $5,000 a quarter, which was a major filer before, to now the proposal is $5,000 a year. And an organization could be an indirect lobbyist even if they never communicate with the city official. Even seeking to influence the position of a third party on a city matter could be considered lobbying activity. So I just want to point that out, and I also urge strongly that the commission does not approve the recommendation for a private right of action. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Berlin. Good morning, <clears throat> thanks for having this opportunity today. My name is Nancy Berlin. I'm from the California Association of Nonprofits. We are a state policy alliance of more than 10,000 nonprofit organizations throughout California. We did an economic impact report on the state of nonprofits in California, and in that report we found that there are more than 6,000 501c3 tax-exempt nonprofits in the city of Los Angeles. That does not include religious congregations. And that most of them are really small. In fact, more than half of them are volunteer organizations with no paid staff at all. So one of the things that, uh, that we looked at in looking at these proposed uh, changes is how it really impacts very small organizations. All nonprofits, as you've heard here, are really driven by their mission and a sense of purpose and passion. We also just surveyed our members this past March about how they're faring in the new federal administration, and what we found was that nonprofits are very concerned about the impact of government in their lives and in their communities, and want to be more involved in public life and civic engagement. So we would like to see that in, in this, this is a time when we need more of that advocacy and we do not want to find uh, barriers in our path. We're, as you've heard, so I'm not gonna go through it, we're a very regulated community. You can go on the Cal Nonprofits website. We have a whole webpage just devoted to compliance and all the different ways the nonprofits have to comply. So we would uh, suggest instead that you look at a broader definition for the exemption. Uh, we would really love to see the exemption be a blanket exemption for all the 501c3 tax exempt nonprofits because that would make it the clearest and the simplest way forward. If you just can't do that, I'll, I'll try to make it brief. Um, 
We hope that you'll at least not be as exclusive as the way the definition is now. I think that a lot of that was meant to be an example, not an exclusive list, and to also look at perhaps the size of organizations. And I can, at another time, give you information that we have about a, a, a break point that makes more sense so that it's not so burdensome. And finally, as you've heard from others, it would just, to be this restrictive would be just an enormous loss for all of us in Los Angeles, because you would be denying all of us the expertise and of people who are really on the ground and know the issues best that impact Los Angeles and the civic engagement and policy decisions that we're trying to make. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Mr. Newman? United Way. Mr. Rubenstein. Good morning, Thank you. My name is Paul Rubenstein. I'm with St. Joseph Center. We are a social service organization based in Venice, but also serving South LA and other parts of the county. We've been around for over 40 years providing critical services for low income and homeless men, women, and children including basic services to help people survive and more comprehensive services to help them get back on their feet and maintain self-sufficiency. Uh, we are very concerned about the proposed regulations. Um, I can tell you from my first-hand experience, almost 15 years at St. Joseph Center, um, my colleague, me, my colleagues at other organizations uh, tend to operate out of an abundance of caution when it comes to any kind of advocacy or anything that might be called lobbying. Uh, board members tend to be very concerned about existing regulations. In the current climate, I think uh, as someone already mentioned what we need is additional advocacy by nonprofits. Uh, we don't need additional burdens. Um, we also have a lot of firsthand experience with NIMBYism being an organization that serves homeless individuals. Um, we don't have substance abuse programs per se, but we work a lot with partners that do. Uh, and I know that uh, organizations that serve those types of populations uh, face a lot of opposition from community members, and giving those community members an additional weapon uh, is, quite frankly, a bit frightening. Um, we already face a lot of opposition, and uh, having another arrow in the quiver um, could be uh, chilling, as a word that I think has been used more than once this morning, if that's absolutely the case. Finally, I just want to say that on a fundamental level, um, organizations like St. Joseph Center, direct service organizations, um, when we perform advocacy, we are doing it on behalf of the most marginalized, the most vulnerable members of our community. We are not benefiting shareholders or owners. Um, I think that in an attempt to create fairness, what is actually potentially going to be set up is a false equivalency and one that could have um, significant negative impacts for the people in our city that have the least voice as it is and depriving them of additional voice in the process um, isn't going to be good for anyone if we all want a just, livable, and inclusive city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Englander? Good morning, commissioners. My name is Adam Englander. I'm a partner and general counsel with Englander, Tommy and Allen. Um, I just want to be quick in terms of this. You know, I'm a little disappointed in terms of the recommendations that have come back since the last meeting that we had. So, like, I really came to and spoke and spoke with a pretty clear direction in terms of the burdens that they have. You know, Donna Hines from our office, who was actually who would be here, but she's on vacation after having spent the last two weeks working on nothing but trying to file lobbying reports. You know, trying to go do it and have this burden every two months and again in a very short period of time just doesn't make a lot of sense and doesn't make it again. It means that it's taken away from any other sort of task in doing it. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to go get these done. Shorting these times, doing these things is really difficult. In addition, you know, there's very little in here that does anything about what we think, um, what a lot of us think is the real problem. I know Aaron Green talked about it last time, I heard it last time, is unregistered lobbyists. It's really disappointing that I can go, bring all these restrictions, you know, in terms of wanting to go and make sure to talk to everybody that I meet with. You know, I walked out of a meeting here two, year, two days ago you know, with a client that is registered and doing everything by the books, and I see an unregistered lobby with these clients come down to me at another, at another office. I see nothing here that does anything with that. I see nothing that's been done at all dealing with the, what is, what is the problem of dozens and dozens of people. If you make these things harder, you're only going to push people. I've seen registered lobbyists fall off the books become unregistered because the requirements that I have now seem too burdensome or they don't want people to know what they're doing. 
you know, if there's a real problem, it's really trying to make sure that everybody is registered and does, you know, and you know, and shows that as much as they can. Trying to show every single meeting is just way too burdensome. And you're going to have people like the people that sue the city council over every single thing on a monthly basis, suing every single lobby. You know, I will be spending my time as general counsel, you know, being in small, you know, being in small claims court or other court, trying to go defend everybody that sues us because they think we might have had a meeting with somebody. Great, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Spiderman. My name is Andrew Schneiderman. I'm representing, uh, I'm, I'm an employee with Los Angeles LA Housing, uh, LA Housing uh, Corporation. We provide affordable housing and supportive services to <clears throat> homeless individuals and families. We've served over 6,000 homeless individuals in Los Angeles County over the last year, moving them uh, to, from the streets to homes. Um, I, I want to reiterate what the other representatives have said, but I just want to reinforce the fact that uh, the staff of a, of a nonprofit uh, advocating for their passion and mission driven causes is a totally different situation from a paid lobbyist uh, representing someone from the for profit community. <clears throat> uh, imposing the same regulations on on employees, the staff of a, a nonprofit would absolutely chill participation of uh, participation of nonprofits in in providing input into public uh, uh, the public debate. And this is a particularly important time when the voice of nonprofits needs to be heard, uh, particularly by organizations like the LA Family Housing representing uh, homeless individuals. Uh, so we obviously. Uh, would support for the blanket exemption for 501c3s in the regulations. Thank you. Thank you. Is Ms. Soto here? Does she want parking? All right. Uh, Peter Pig. Really nice of you. Thank you. Also? Thank you. All right. 
Thank you everyone for coming, for sharing your <laughs> perspective. Um, these are, I, there's a reason we've been talking about this for two years, these are difficult questions. And um, I was kind of taking notes on where I think we are in terms of focusing our questions and concerns. Um, and yeah, I think it's, our concerns have focused in on four areas or four, four and a half areas, similar to those that we discussed last time. Um, the first concern is timing, and most of what I heard was concerns about the 10-day requirement. Um, the second includes the private attorney general, the private right of action, and um, the third, the contact details we've heard about in the past, um, and then the fourth, I think, separately and away from all of that are the 501c3 um, issues. And I say separately in the sense that um, to the extent people are generally complaining about the, the requirements being too burdensome, then it seems to me that the 501c3s will feel that in a way the most kind of intimate. Um, I think we're working on that. Oh, okay. Um, all right, so uh, it strikes me that um, perhaps we should proceed um, kind of concern by concern. Um, I will say, and I've, I've shared this with staff and no one feels um, blindsided in any way, that I am concerned that um, well, look, the people who are coming saying we're worried are the people who are complying. And we do not want to regulate people into oblivion. And I'm not saying that's what we're doing, but I'm saying I'm, I'm concerned because uh, something in there rings true to me that uh, unregistered lobbyists are not showing up because they are simply not part of the system. And I think it is true that they are a huge concern. And I do want to acknowledge that I think the people who are coming here and they're vigorously saying, I am worried, it's because you plan on complying. And um, I, I want to tell you that we all appreciate that and appreciate that you're taking the time to give us feedback. And my sense is, if we heard nothing, it would be because people were just kind of checked out and said, well, we don't, we don't plan on trying to um, adhere to your regulations. Um, the other thing that I want to say is, I think I speak for everyone on the commission when I say we are very uh, concerned and grateful about the work that 501c3 organizations are doing, and we in no way want to inhibit that. We are weighing public interests, and one is allowing 501c3s to flourish and uh, continue to do what they're doing, which I agree is increasingly important now, and the other is to allow for the public to have information um, about who is trying to sway their uh, representatives, and I think that those are both important. Um, and with respect to 501c3s, um, well, okay, I, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. So my, um, my suggestion is, that perhaps we can tackle um, a bucket of concern by bucket of concern, and but let me hear comments about approach first. Oh. Is, <laughs> does that, does that I mean, sound like we've, a, we've been having these conversations uh, for quite some time, and we we're, we're getting input and feedback, and. Um, I know we want to put it to bed, however, I, I, I am very concerned about certain areas, so I don't know if we maybe, we just want to go commissioner by commissioner and kind of discuss our evolution, or is that an impractical um, and burdensome? Well, I thought maybe we can go, so my worry about going commissioner and by commissioner is that you're going to say something that I really want to talk about with respect to the 10 day window, and then by the time we yeah. finish, I've kind of lost, it's like, or we could go, I, so my thought is maybe we do substantive area by substantive okay, area, but we all weigh in on each. Okay. Um, I, I, 
agree with that. Okay. I agree with that. I have a couple of just general sort yeah. of comments yeah. too, because uh, I did hear uh, not only in the written comments. First of all, some of the new written comments were extraordinarily helpful, and, and I think done with great skill and uh, with appropriate reading of what the staff had, had done, and that was just very impressive. They were very helpful. Uh, I also think that. Um, Unfortunately, I was not able to be at the 501c3 uh, meeting, uh, but I was at the interested persons, uh, the other interested persons meeting, and I found that to be very helpful. I also think the new material that we do have from the staff has been equally helpful. Uh, it was clear, it is clear from the new material that the staff listened to what happened in those interested persons meeting, listened and read all of these other things, and is set out where they still are because that's where they still are uh, but I am impressed by the amount that they listened and heard and understand what the uh, objections are although obviously the staff still uh, disagrees uh, so that that's sort of an overview of, 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 where we, of where I am in terms of process and just we'll go bucket by bucket that, that's helpful um, so, shall we start with um, the timeline? Because it seems like that's where many things begin. Um, I heard the, I, I've never been a lobbyist, I've never filed a disclosure report. I heard some comments which concerned me regarding particularly the 10 day filing period and this accelerated period. And I know what we're trying to do is balance the fact that if we're gonna provide disclosure, it's kind of useless if, useless if it comes so much later that the item is over, everybody's forgotten, everybody's time and energy has moved on to the next thing. And so what's the point of even disclosing if it's, and I mean the FEC deals with this, the FPPC deals with this, we deal with this. What's the point of it coming out there if it's so late in the game that it, it's not really useful information? Um, having said that, I I don't want to create a system where nonprofits and for profits are forced to essentially employ an admin who is there to, um, to to comply with our requirements because they just come co almost constantly. So um, I have significant concerns about uh, the 10 day requirement and um, I apologize, I actually plan on starting from my left, so Commissioner Gordon, if you wanna um, talk about the, the timelines at all. Um, I, I, I do think that uh, some of the most persuasive if, uh, uh, communications uh, that I heard in the various meetings uh, were from the people uh, in the trenches and those people who actually had to uh, uh, come after uh, those uh, persons for the information so that uh, they can they can file. So, uh, I mean, I did have 20 years almost in uh, one of the big firms, and uh, but I also started as a uh, receptionist and then a legal secretary and an office manager, and I do remember some of my concerns as an office manager. With uh, so I do understand. Uh, those 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 cons those uh, concerns. I, I believe we should have the more uh, uh, more uh, the reporting more often. Uh, but the idea of ten days, whether as the staff has already suggested in its materials to us, if if we extended the time for vacations, of people being out of town, all of those various things, a, a certain amount of time. I have, I have some sympathy for that. And you know what, I, in thinking about this, I think perhaps I should not have unbuckled or, or uncoupled the reporting period from the filing deadline. Yeah. Um, because I think those two things taken together is what we're <coughs> causing more anxiety. And so we're moving from quarterly to bi-monthly, or the proposals to move from quarterly to bi-monthly, and to move from last day of the month at the end of the reporting, uh, quarterly reporting period to 10 days after the end of the bi-monthly uh, reporting period. 
so I think that we should think about those two things because um, as I learned from reading many cases, the more you look at each thing in isolation, it doesn't look all that burdensome, but then when you look at things holistically and taken as a whole, all of a sudden there's just a lot of things to do. Um, so, uh, Vice President Overstock. So I, I'll be brief because I feel like um, a lot of my sentiments have already been expressed. But um, you know, I do I appreciate all of the work that staff has put into this, um, and you know, it's clearly a lot of work um, and, and very very thoughtful to arrive where you're at. And I also want to acknowledge how um, both communities that are going to be affected by this are are you know reiterating this chilling effect and. Um, the fact that so many people are here today tells me that these communities do want to comply. And I think that it is our job to, um, in, in order to ensure transparency, to make it easier for them to comply. Um, that said, I also want to echo President Levinson's sentiments that we don't want the reporting to be so far down the line that, that it's actually moved. Um, and, and I think you know, there, there, there can be a happy medium. Um, I know one of the things we talked about at, at the last meeting was, um, you know, when, when people are reporting, having drop-down menus, which will simplify the reporting process, um, and, and maybe with this new website, uh, that's a possibility. Um, but, I, but I think, you know, finding some kind of um, medium that's, that this, that's longer than 10 days, um, maybe it's 20 days, maybe it's 15, um, to, to make it, um, you know, so that the people who want to comply are complying and the people who are not complying, um, that maybe this is some kind of carrot <coughs> to get people who are not registered as lobbyists um, to, to see how easy it is to register. Otherwise, you know, we, we have to address that issue. Uh, um, I um, I and echo the sentiments of my fellow commissioners. Um, I don't have a problem with uh, the change from quarterly to bi-monthly. I know it is an additional burden and someone who absolutely hates to do paperwork but has to because I am a lawyer. Um, I totally, I, I, I get that. Um, I also have no problem and would recommend definitely extending the filing deadline to 20 and, or even 30 days, because I know, and I think one of, I think it was Mr. Sutton or someone else who brought up the fact that uh, one of the other individuals who testified that people go on vacation and around the holidays and that gets very burdensome and we don't want to have you sitting there trying to sip on a Mai Tai when you're just <laughs> having figures in your head where you should be really relaxing. So I, um, I would definitely propose if and when, when we will vote on this, um, when we vote on this to extend the, the filing period from t definitely from 10 and 20 or maybe even 30 days. That would be my recommendation on that issue. Mr. Sun, you only requested an additional uh, 20 days. You should have gone for 50 and see, see if anyone was paying attention. Yeah, with more streamlined reporting. With more, I, no, no, we're just doing every little slice in isolation. Um, well, it seems to me that, one, we want to get moving on actually voting on some things, and two, it seems to me that there may be some consensus on the timing issue among um, the commission. Um, I happen to be in the 15, 20 range, but okay. yes, yes. Okay, um, <clears throat> well, there's two timing issues. The first is reporting the reporting period, and it sounds like, and, um, it, it sounds like there may be support for the every two months for the bi-monthly with, with the understanding that we relax the 10 days to um, perhaps 20. Okay. okay. Um, how do we proceed in terms of, I would like to start getting things off the table. Can we, can we vote? section by section, or actually, you know what, I think that we should, I think we should note that that's what we seem to be comfortable with, and then I think we should look at everything one last time. Today, uh, after we ordered from Falafel King. So, I haven't forgotten it.
All right, so um, somebody who has better handwriting than I do will note that for the time, for the timing issues, it looks like there's consensus for bi-monthly and 20 days. Okay. All right, um, the next issue is um, that we can talk about is the private right of action, the private attorney general. I, oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 I prefer in these buckets to buckets going through the, the overall lobbying requirements. Okay. I see the private cause of action as its own piece and a lot of different history. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's do um, direct communication next. Thank you. I think that's exactly right. All right, so um, we have heard the current law requires disclosure of the city agency being attempted to influence. So the current law is what we see in our quarterly lobby reports, where you have the client, the agency, and the subject matter. And um, the proposal would require, my sense is, substantially more detail. And uh, the date, the official's title, the division, and the agency. And um, I, I, I am troubled by Mr. Berghoff's um, bathroom break uh, scenario. Um, I am troubled by the, you know, what, what we all have happened, which is um, you get a text, you get an email, you're, you're driving and you're working on one thing and you're talking to somebody else. And um, one thing that occurs to me is whether or not um, this would actually require the principals to basically do a lot, spend a lot more time, the lobbyists themselves spending a lot more time doing the reporting um, than, than allowing that to be facilitated by administrative staff because it seems to me that this is, uh, would require kind of a, a pad and pen in your pocket almost at all times. Again, for the people who, I think the people who are showing up today because they in earnest want to comply. And I'd like a little help on what really is a direct communication with city officials and whether it has anything at all to do with going to bath uh, bathroom breaks. Uh, I'll happily answer that question. Uh, my name is Armin Tarzi, Director of Policy for the Record. I'm accompanied by my esteemed colleague, Mark Lowe, the Lobbying Program Manager. Um, and also, uh, just briefly, if I can, just to thank everyone for the feedback they provided. We did um, not only held two, but three interested persons meeting. Uh, we went out on the road uh, to give some council alliances to uh, solicit feedback. We also tabled, uh, a, we had a table here at City Hall for the Congress of Neighborhoods where you talk to elected neighborhood council members about our proposals as well. I lost my voice around three o'clock talking about lobbying uh, activities. Um, so, and I also wanna thank everyone here today for providing their feedback and um, to those individuals who, you know, they mentioned that they couldn't make it today because, you know, their nine to five jobs or their other life obligations, but there's a time to write in uh, public comments as well. So I just wanna thank everyone. Uh, to answer your question about what direct communication is, uh, it's when a, a, someone, a lobbyist uh, who's being compensated uh, corresponds with uh, a city official uh, or answers their questions uh, or through an agent does that for the purpose of, of influencing them for that particular project. Um, with our proposal, um, I know this- uh, Where do you find the, for yeah. the purpose of influencing? I'm sorry, what's up? Where, where, where is it that, that people can look to see that language of for the purpose of influencing? It's in that definition. Uh, under direct communication, uh, we state for the purpose of attempting to influence. Um, and that's further defined as directly or indirectly uh, promoting, supporting, or opposing, uh, or seeking to modify or delay action on a city matter uh, by any means. Uh, and we also have a few examples uh, there as well. Um, so, so that's generally the, what the definitions are. And when we're looking at this, it's, when we're trying to find that, as, as I was stated earlier, that happy medium, you know, we, we we did study, of course, what other jurisdictions are doing. So we're not we're trying to find that happy medium between what we currently have, where it's just the city the city agency, and what other jurisdictions have. For example, uh, the city official's name, uh, the total number of contacts with that official, the method of communication, and the date of every particular communication. So staff has attempted to find that happy medium, uh, if you will, and. 
looking at this holistically, uh, you know, lobbying is a human-based enterprise. Lobbyists are traditionally hired because they have those relationships at City Hall. They know who to talk to. Uh, you know, generally speaking, they know the contacts that need to be made uh, to get something moving or to get information to someone. That's why traditionally you do hire a lobbyist because of those relationships. Those relationships are, are usually well established, uh, and, and that's why we want to kind of capture that information. Um, the way our current law works, it's just a city agency, and as, as we mentioned at the last meeting, these agencies have several thousand employees. I mean, DWP, I think, has 8,000 roughly employees. That's bigger than almost 100 cities in California alone. Um, so that's, those are the definitions, and that's where staff was coming from with this proposal. What about the issue of not having an updated website, or having to either not have an updated database of city employees, or having to go to seven different places, or what frankly happens to me, which is someone comes up to me and says, it's so great to see you, and you have a conversation, and you have a fairly lengthy conversation, and then you're kind of figuring out what you should say and who they are, and I mean, no offense to my 5,000 students who I really individually care about, but you know, I'm not always sure. Are you from this class, are you from that class? Sure, and in that particular instance, if they're just coming, you know, to say hi to you, you know who this person well, is. Well, but, but all of a but, sudden they ask something detailed, mm -hmm. and I say, thank you for that comment, and here's how you would approach that question. Right. And now I am kind of saying, and I think you should do that, but I don't totally know if they're from this year's marital property or last year's marital property or... So just to clarify, you're the lobbyist. You're coming yeah. to communicate with the city official. You know, I'm or? in city hall. Oh, okay. I'm in city hall, and I'm waiting for someone who I actually know who I'm going to meet. But then somebody comes up to me and says, "Jessica, it's so great to see you. Um, I heard you're working on this. Shouldn't we talk about it?" And they clearly know me, but I don't. I can't really place who they are. But I understand that it's an opportunity for me to talk to them about something right. that involves one of my clients. So if this is the, like, Jessica has a bad memory example. Right. So in this particular case, uh, because you need to disclose that, uh, yeah, you would ask, and I'm, I'm assuming a lobbyist would ask because the fundamental purpose of lobbying and representing your client is to represent right. the city agency. So just under that particular example. Well, I know it's somebody in that agency. Right. But who are they in exactly? I'm not sure. Right. And, and, and again, going back to the whole human enterprise, uh, Usually, uh, generally speaking, a lobbyist would most likely ask, oh, can I, you know, they have your, card, they have your business example. card, what's your position, or uh, where do I know you from? Uh, there's a thousand examples I can give. Uh, but yeah, usually, because it is a human enterprise, because lobbying is a relation, relationship-based industry, you're, you're looking for those relationships and those contacts. But yeah, I, I understand your point. There will be times where you might not know who specifically you're talking to, but maybe this will now give you more incentive to understand the person you're interested in. Well, or, but it's, I know them, but I can't, you know, it's the kind of like, they know me so well that, but it's too late for me to say, remind me of your name. Is this the type of communication that you also think should be included in the recording? I just no, to well, let me, yeah, and I appreciate you bringing that up uh, to clarify. <laughs> The name is actually not important, so if you were trying to avoid that kind of awkward situation, you could say, hey, what was your title again? <laughs> you know, some, something like that, because we're not asking for the name, we're only asking for their position title. And also, we have, have a whole lot of, with the intent to influence in that example. Right. Exactly, yeah. So, it, and that's why initially it started as a hello, but I guess it moved on. Well, to right. Well, right. So, could, yeah. so could there be um, a modification of job title and as you said, the DWP has 5,000 employees, mm -hmm. in, and in their structure, they at least have departments. So I wonder if going beyond city agency to identify departments, you know, so if there are seven people in the room who have, because it doesn't, it doesn't actually tell them you that much of anything if, it's, if there are seven people and they all have a title, policy analyst number four, right? right? But, but, you know, the department, that I wonder if, if that couldn't be um, a, a modification. So it tells us, okay, you know, they're, they're meeting to discuss land use uh -huh. within you know, BP or if, if that. 
that's something yeah we could we could look into if we're looking to increase that specificity mm -hmm. uh, with that kind of direct communication. Right. Yeah, I mean currently the law only um, requires people to disclose the particular agency. It does not provide for uh, them to drill further down and separate it by section or division. I'm not sure that every agency has that, mm -hmm. um, but potentially. I'm just, what, I'm just I'm trying to think about you know how to create more transparency without trying to create additional burdens and and having you know seven people or five people who all work for the same department, uh, you know, or if there are multiple even multiple departments or divisions <clears throat> is for me more informative than knowing a person's job title, you know, especially knowing all of the job, like I do know some of the job titles in the city and they're not indicative of anything, right? When I when I worked in the Bureau of Ocean Administration, for instance, everybody coming in had the job title policy analyst. Like that's what everybody's card said. So it wouldn't have told anybody anything, but if you knew that they were working in um, gain reduction development, that, that would be helpful. No, we, yeah, we agree. That's why uh, we agree. Division would add that kind of specificity along with the position title. I just I have a concern and again I I've, I've done advocacy I have done lobbying on behalf of different organizations I belong to uh, not in the city of Los Angeles but so we have a meeting set up with senator so and so or assembly member so and so or congressperson so and so and we go in with our delegation and we meet with the senator and senator goes hey here is my policy guy whose issue is doing the bank of, of, of affordable housing 